So we left off with applications, circuits with two sources in it, and looking at a solution by substitution. So we've got our two expressions uh, for our circuit. 40 volts is equal to 3,000 I2 plus 1,000 I3 as one of our circuit loops. And then 60 volts is equal to minus 2,000 times I2 plus 3,000 times current I3. So those are our two loops that we worked with. So with the first expression, we're going to solve for I2. So we're going to solve for 3000 I2 by uh, isolating I2 in the circuit. So I2 then becomes equal to 40 volts minus 1000 I3 divided by 3000 when we uh, rearrange the terms and multiply through. So we get 13.3 milliamps when we divide 3000 into 40 and we're going to subtract 3.33 times 10 to the minus 1 I3 when we, uh, when we multiply through with 3,000 into 1,000, one-third. Substituting then this value for I2 into the second equation, 60 volts minus 20 volts I2 plus 3,000 I3, gives us an expression then that eliminates one of the terms. It eliminates I2 so that we only have every, everything in terms of I3. So minus 2,000 times 13.3 milliamps minus 3.33 times 10 to the minus 1 I3 plus 3,000 then becomes our terms that we've uh, multiplied through and added into the second equation. So we end up with 60 volts is equal to minus 26.7 volts plus 667 I3 plus 3000 I3, which gives us minus 26.7 plus 3670 I3 when we combine the terms. Continuing to solve for I3, then we end up with 87.7 volts equal to 3670 I3, or current 3 equal to 23.6 milliamps. Now if we substitute this value of I3 back into the second equation, that's the 60 volt equation, we have minus 2000 I2 plus 3000, make the substitution of 23.6 times 10 to the minus third or, or milliamps, and we get 2000 I2 in the negative plus 70.8 volts. Solving for I2 then, we end up with an I2 value of 5.54 milliamps. So I1 and the voltage drops would be the same as those that we calculated when the solution was by adding and subtraction. Again, some differences may exist due to rounding. Next, solving by determinants. So we start off with our two expressions, 31 and 33. We've got them set up here so that we can pull out our elements. There's our K elements, our A elements, and our B elements. So we've got everything in terms of the two currents, I2 and I3. So A1 and A2, B1 and B2, K1 and K2. We rearrange them into the matrix so that we have our determinant form here, K1 minus, or K1B minus K2B. A1, B2, A2, B1 then become our expansion values. They, you know, they didn't show the step here where we had the determinant. We do the expansion and we end up with an I2 of 5.45 milliamps, just like we saw in the previous. And in I3, again, we do the determinant form, then we do the expansion. When we do the expansion, we end up with 23.6 milliamps. Values for I1 and the voltage drops then are calculated as before. So again, the, the other method, the third method that allowed us to solve uh, based on the fact that we had our expressions already set up, made for an easy and quick solution. So you have to recognize that uh, equation 31 and 33 are really the same equations that we used in the previous example. Okay, so we've got um, several 
schematics here with arrangements, different arrangements of the resistors and the sources uh, in uh, series parallel arrangements here. You can see in uh, B we've got a source that's in series with R2 and in C on the other side of R3. So we've got several ways that we can look at. Again, these are set up by doing our left-hand loop, our right-hand loop, and our outside loop the same way as we saw previously for each one of these. So in the example 1411, we use simultaneous equations or determinants to find the currents and the voltage drops of the circuits in figure 14.8 A, B, and C. So it's asking you to take these apart, do the analysis using substitution and determinants. Um, you probably would be best to go through uh, and, and solve these using those different methods, more so the determinants, so that you get used to the methodology. The solution says, remember, your method of solution may be different from that of the author because you may not assume this, the direction of the currents or you may use the same loop current. So that's something that you always have to be aware of when you are working examples uh, that somebody else has done. You want to make sure you understand how they selected their polarity and their current flow uh, because you could end up with differences um, that are yielded because you chose a different direction for the currents. So in figure A, this first figure here, which looks very similar to what we did previously, the solution uses the loops that contain the current E1, R1, R2, E1, E2, R1, and R3. Assume that the direction of currents results from E1, starting at the positive terminal of E1 and moving in a clockwise direction. So they're telling you to start with the positive. If we start with the positive here on the lower side of E1, then everything else follows through with the um, proper polarity when you start laying these out. So the expressions then become E1 minus V1 minus V2 equals 0. E1 minus V1 minus V2 equals 0. So they've done this left-hand side. E1 then is equal to the sum of the two voltage drops of V1 and V2, and 40 volts is our source. So we've got 40 volts there as our source. V1 plus V2. We end up then with an expression that says 40 volts is equal to 100 times the current I1 plus 330 times the current I2. For the next one, E1 minus V1 plus E2 minus V3. So if we look at that, we've got R1, E2, and R3 as our outside equation. So this is the outside equation. So in gathering our terms, E1 plus E2 is equal to V1 plus V3. Again, since we know our voltages, sources 40 volts and 30 volts, that simply becomes 70, and we're left with V1 plus V3, to which we can substitute our IR expression, the current and the resistance. So if we look at, we had resistor 100, resistor 220, so there's our resistor 100 and 220. If we assume that the current I1 is the turtle current, then I2 must equal the difference in I1 minus I3. So we're looking at the split that occurs about this middle member to reduce I1, I2, and I3. So we end up with our expressions, 40 volts equals 100 plus 330 I2, which was 1435 as identified. And if we make that substitution for um, I2 in the expression, I2 is equal to I1 minus I3. 
Here's our substitution. Now we have turned this expression into two unknowns in terms of I1 and I3. Multiplying by 4.3, again, that 4.3 seems like a weird number, but we're just trying to pick a number that allows us to um, do our substitutions and come up with a value that we can subtract. So the author chose 4.3 when we multiplied through by that value and we end up with 430 and 430. So we're trying to kill off the 430 term here so that we're only in terms of I3. So 40 volts, 430 minus 330. 301 equals 430 plus 946. Now when I do my um, subtractions, I end up with a minus 261 equals minus 1276. That's convenient. Both of them are minuses, so they normalize out to a positive value. I3 then equals the quotient, 261 volts divided by 1267 ohms, or 205 milliamps. So if we take and substitute in equation 36, let's go back here, 36 is 70 volts equals 100 I1 plus 220 I3, and make that substitution for I3, 205 milliamps, we are able to solve for I2 in this case, because that's all that's left, 249 milliamps. Substituting then equation 35, which is, you'll recall from back here, this was 35 up here that we went through and solved for that loop. Solving for 1435, 40 volts equals 100 I1 plus 330 I2. Putting that value in then of 249 milliamps in for I1, we're able to solve for I2. So 40 volts is equal to 24.9 volts plus 330 I2. So this, as we go through here, 15.1 volts equals 330 I2, or I2 equals 45.8 milliamps. The next step then is to calculate our voltage drops. Each of our voltage drops then, V1 is equal to I1 R1, as we've seen before. Put in our values and we end up with 24.9 for V2, 15.1 for V3, 45.1 volts. So we've gotten all of our currents, we've gotten all of our voltage drops, we already knew our source voltage. Okay, so your text goes through um, and does the same iterations for figure 14b. Again, you create your two loops, solve one in terms of the other, just as they've done here. I'm not going to go through these. I'm going to let you work through these. It's a good, uh, a good um, practice to go through here. Follow these. The steps are fairly clear. Um, you should be able to see by now why they chose to do what they did, all the way from solving for each of the currents in the first part to doing the substitutions and solving for it the voltage drops individually. For the third uh, schematic, 14.8C, again, they created their loops, E1, E2, R1, R2, and as such, it's the same process. You just have to keep track of your signs and know when you are adding or subtracting sources as they become additive or uh, sources that um, are inverse to each other. Okay, so then in this case, um, they actually set up the an array with their values. Again, they selected A1, A2, B1, B2, K1, K2, put them into the determinant forms for each of the currents and solved finally by saying that the current through uh, I4 is equal to the difference in I3 and the value of I1 above. Okay, 
The negative value of I4 then tells us that we assume the wrong direction. So this was something that you, know, you were warned of, and to be careful, and the author is just trying to show you that um, it can happen, and you have to be aware uh, if you end up with a negative value that you chose a um, the wrong direction for a current. So you can see here this minus 520 microamps for I4 is just telling you that the current was going the wrong direction. It doesn't make the value wrong, it just makes the, the polarity wrong because we chose the wrong direction. Once we have our values here, you can see they put the positive value in, multiply it times each of the resistors, we got our drops, and then we start to apply Kirchhoff's law as we did before. So that is all of the uh, applications using two sources and all three methods that we've learned in this chapter to solve for simultaneous linear equations.